Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. It's a webinar where we're going to discuss Lyme disease. Um, no two weeks are ever the same because uh, your questions determine what we're going to talk about. So as usual, I'm very interested to see what you have in store for me this evening. Uh, for those of you that are new, welcome here. I'm glad to see some new names, and uh, I hope you get some useful information out of this. Uh, for those of you that are coming back, uh, welcome back again, too. I see a, a number of, of people that are returning, which I think means you're getting some value out of this. So I'm glad to see that I've got it can help you um, along this uh, journey called Lyme disease and tick-borne infections and mold toxicity and whatever else we, we, we throw into this pot of chronic illness here. Uh, for So the way that you participate, uh, there's a couple ways. Number one, um, during the webinar, I'm going to be taking questions. And you can see, you can hear me read the questions, but also if you're in the live version, I post them on your screen. So you actually get to read along with me too. And you can see what those questions are and what the responses I give. Um, as, as many of you know, I, I try to explain a lot of things based on that question. So I just don't answer the question quickly. I give you some background on it too. So it gives a um, good background and good way to learn about this illness basically. Um, the other thing, if you are um, so inclined, uh, write a question to me. And the way you do it, there's a chat box on your screen. And I always mess up as to where it is. It may be on the upper corner, maybe lower corner, but there's a chat box. Okay. And uh, you can use that chat box to write a question to me. The only thing I ask, two things. Number one, try to be shorter with your questions. Um, this format does not work out well for very long, complicated questions because I can't ask you repeat uh or questions to further clarify information, okay? And number two, as you're writing your question, uh, do not hit the enter key to create paragraphs. Um, only hit the enter key when you're ready to send the complete question to me, okay? So write your question as a big uh, run-on paragraph, if you will, and, uh, and then I'll be able to get it. If you hit the enter key while you're writing it, it actually sends different pieces of your question to me, and it gets hard for me to follow it on my side of the screen here, all right? So tonight, as usual, I am creating a recording, and if everything goes as well and that recording works, um, I will be editing it up later this evening and then creating a synopsis for you early tomorrow morning, and then I'll get an email out to you with that synopsis, and that email also will announce that the uh, recording is ready to be seen, all right? So look for that usually somewhere around 9, 9.30 in the morning Central Standard Time, okay, uh, here in Austin, Texas, all right? And then... Um, the other thing you'll have an opportunity to do in that uh, email tomorrow morning is sign up for the next uh, webinar. And we're actually doing four webinars in February. So the fourth one will be next week. And then I'm going to take a week off. So, um, uh, you know, keep that in mind. If you're hesitating about maybe showing up next week, keep in mind, it'll be the last one for a couple of weeks. Okay. All right. And so I think that pretty much answers it. Oh, the other thing I just let people know, I'm starting to entertain the idea of taking the recordings from these webinars and turning them into a, um, posting them as a podcast actually. So you'll have different ways. You can either watch the video if you happen to be out driving in your car and you wanna listen to me. <laughs> I don't know why you'd wanna do that, but if you wanna listen to me on a podcast, you'll be able to do that. So I'm starting to entertain about doing that. So uh, you, I'll give out further information about that in the future too, all right? All right, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started here. We'll take the first question here. Hello, Denise. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Is there a way to know if psychiatric symptoms are mental disorders or related to tick-borne infections? I heard that a large percentage of sudden psychiatric disease, especially in children, um, is caused by Bartonella and mold toxicity and are not diagnosed properly because there are few peer-reviewed studies. Why do you think that there is little interest from all doctor specialties like infectious disease doctors? Is it feared to be chased by medical boards? If you have a child developing psychiatric symptoms, what would be a proper screening to exclude inflammatory psychiatric disorders that can't be treated by psych meds? Cunningham panel, mold urine test, immunoblock test, autoimmune markers, what would you recommend? All right. So, boy, the, um, the politics when it comes to tick-borne infections, <laughs> any tick-borne infection, whether it's Bartonella, uh, Borrelia, any of those infections is just, it's beyond a discussion here. And unfortunately, a lot of my colleagues just don't 
buy that that infections can give you a lot of problems okay unfortunately all right um but anyhow the you know the two major infections that i think of when it comes to acute psychiatric disorders or conditions that give you acute psychiatric disorders one would be um a streptococcus a group a infection strep a which is a bacteria sometimes associated with pans and pandas and then bartonella okay Although you mentioned um, mold toxicity as a cause of uh, psychiatric disorders, I, I tend not to see that. I mean, I tend to see some maybe anxiety, but I tend not to see the severe psychiatric disorders with mold toxicity. I do see severe psychiatric disorders with Bartonella. I do see severe psychiatric disorders with, um, uh, with strep infections, all right? So the way that you test to see if you might have one of those is actually do um, a, a, a test to see if you have the infections. Now, I know the Cunningham panel has certain uh, markers on it that would suggest you have an infection, but it doesn't prove you have an infection, all right? So the best ways, in my opinion, to look for this is to do, uh, to see if you have a strep infection, is to do something called an ASO titer. And then to look and see if you have a Bartonella would be to do um, an Igenix uh, laboratory test called their immunoblot. And they're, the reason I choose them uh, versus other ways to look for Bartonella is they probably have the test that is the most sensitive against the most strains. By sensitive, I mean it has the greatest ability to find the infections. And part of the reason, um, and one of the other things that's good about their test is it looks up against, uh, to see if you have infections from a broad number of strains of Bartonella. Okay. So we think that maybe there are 15 strains of Bartonella that can give, infect people and potentially give psychiatric disorders and a whole host of other problems too. And um, Igenix looks to, uh, uses their immunobot, which is a, a technique to see, are you making antibodies against certain proteins found on these Bartonella germs, okay? And they have the ability to look and see if you have antibodies against proteins from four specific strains. And in addition, they have the ability to see if you have antibodies against the genus or the species of Bartonella. So when they do that, when they report their tests, if you're negative on one of the four, but your species test is positive, it means you have Bartonella uh, from one of the other 11 strains, basically, okay? Um, and so I, th I tend to think that is the most sensitive test. There is also another lab out there called Galaxy Labs that is doing a, a, DN, um, a PCR method to see if you have the genetic material of Bartonella. The, the issue I have with that is they've never gone out and been able, done any testing to determine how sensitive their test is at finding it. It is true, if you have the genetic material of the germ in you, you have the infection, okay? But they've never done the test to say how often do they find it when it's there. Uh, the immunoblot technique through um, uh, Igenix, they've got some data suggesting a sensitivity, the ability to find it of about 95%, okay? So that's why I suggest people go in that direction, all right? Um, Yeah. I, I, oh, in terms of autoimmune markers, you know, they're they're not going to type there's the infection causing it. All right. So if you want to know, is it infectious? You've got to do the ASO titers and you've got to do the, um, again, I suggest getting the Igenix immunoblot test for Bartonella. Okay. Uh, both the IgM antibody test and the IgG antibody test. All right. Um, Denise, uh, good luck, it, especially if you have a, a child that's having problems here. Um, good luck. Well, even if you don't have a child that's having problems, if you're having problems. Um, good luck figuring this out. Okay. Hello, Doug. This is yeah, Dr. Ross. Could you try to comment on a saliva test I did from um, Diagnostex? to test cortisol, DHEA, and other items. I have Lyme, BART, and mold toxicity. The test was ordered by my Lyme doctor in light of my severe chronic fatigue, inflammation, and anxiety. The cortisol results are um, 6 to 8 a.m., 7, which was with, or, oh, it was 7, and then range normally is 13 to 24. 
11 a.m. to 1 p.m. four with a range of five to 10, four to 5 p.m. four with a range of three to eight, and 10 midnight three with a range of one to four. My DEHA characterizes DHEA plus DHEA sulfate is two with a range of three to 10. The lab report assesses the correlation between cortisol and DHEA using the average of 12 to one and four to five uh, p.m. values. Um, the report says that based on the correlation, my cortisol is normal, DHEA is low, my insulin, 17 hydroxy progesterone, total saliva, salivary, SIGA, and gluten antibody SIG are normal. I'm also getting thyroid and iron tests, but they are pending. What do you think of the conclusion of this lab? Um, you know, if you look at, so if I look at the, the numbers, um, your cortisol in the morning is low um, because you have seven and the normal range is 13 to 24 first thing in the morning. And your 11 a.m. is also low because you have a level four and normal is five to 10. So your morning values are low, which suggests some degree of adrenal fatigue or adrenal stress, okay? Also, your DHEA is just slightly on the low side as well too. So I wouldn't not interpret that as normal. Now, I will tell you, um, the uh, saliva testing, there's some, I mean, no doctors do it, but there's some accuracy issues. There's been people that have gone out and taken saliva examples and sent, uh, a, you know, person spits twice, sends them to the lab and, and they don't identify who the patient is and you get slightly different results, okay? So there's some, maybe some accuracy issues here, okay? But the testing still does suggest some low adrenals. Usually what I'd like to do in a situation like this, Doug, is to work with the herbal uh, medicine called ashwagandha. So ashwagandha is an herbal medicine um, that comes to us out of both Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic East Indian medicine. They both use it. It's got uh, good animal studies that show better um, uh, adrenal response and even thyroid response as well. And so um, I like using it because I think it's gentle, tends not to jack a person up too much, and can actually be quite effective at helping correct some of that really just slightly low numbers in the morning, okay? So the way I usually have people take it is I'll have them take, uh, so it comes as a 400 to 500 milligram pill, depending on which brand you use. And um, I would have a person take one or two pills first thing in the morning, um, and then uh, take another one or two pills between 1 and 2 p.m. I tend not to like it use it at night. Uh, I know some people use it for sleep, but I've never find it helpful for sleep. I think it actually jacks people up too much. So I tend not to use it at nighttime, okay? All right. But that's, um, that's what I would do with that, Doug. All right. Um, good luck to you. Let's see. Hello, Jessica. Hi, Dr. Ross. I'm so grateful for your website and resources. You're welcome. Last week, you mentioned Morgellons disease, and I was wondering you could talk about what is known currently about treating Morgellons. The short version of my story is that I have Morgellons disease with symptoms dating back to 2018. But it wasn't until May of 2023 that I even heard of Morgellons in this connection to Lyme and co-infections. At that time, I tested positive for Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia. I have a significant lesion in my toe that causes me a lot of pain. It's like there is a splinter trapped under the skin that no one can see, let alone remove. I have been treated for Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia since May of 2023 by a Lyme literate doctor, but unfortunately, I have made little progress and had some tough negative side effects. I've tried a range of medication combinations, including methylene blue, uh, doxycycline, azithromycin, <coughs> ses yara, uh, mepron, albendazole, ivermectin, and fluconazole. I've tried ivermectin and ketoconazole. Let's see, there's a second part here, I think. Hold on a minute. Uh, cre uh, creams and topicals, and I'm taking many supplements. 
I've had some benefit with some more general symptoms, but the biggest issue is the pain in my toe. And the only thing that seems to be helping with that has been Dapsone 5% gel, heparin cream, and uh, draw salve. I recently discovered Virginia Savely and began looking at the presentation talks on her website. I've been reading her book on Morgellons. It is incredibly validating and helpful to see my symptoms and experiences reflected in it and to know that she has seen exactly my symptoms and others and treat them successfully. I am encouraged that I might benefit from knowledge gained from her experience treating this very specific symptom cluster. I know you have mentioned Mergellans in your webinars, and I was hoping you might be able to help answer some questions that have been coming up for me. My questions are, in one of her 2020 presentations, Savely mentions that she has found only slight improvements in Mergellans. Okay. So, Jessica, this this is just, it's too much to handle in, uh, in, in a webinar like this um, to actually ask me direct questions about, she said this, she said this, but I'm going to give you an overview on Martellans, okay? And a lot of this is consistent with what um, Ginger Savely writes about too. So there are um, four different, so in people that have Morgellons, there have been four different bacteria that have been identified. And the big two are uh, Borrelia, which is Lyme, Bartonella, uh, H. pylori, actually, and a type of Treponema, which is another type of spirochete. Okay, those are the four bacteria that have been identified. And what, what um, Ginger Savely says, and also what I saw in my practice, is that um, if you treat the bar the Bartonella, and if you treat the Borrelia, I'm not so much sure about the Treponema and the H. pylori because I usually focus just on the Bartonella and the Borrelia. Uh, in my practice, about 90% or more of Morgellons would go away. Now, um, Ginger Savely says it's maybe two thirds or a little bit more in her practice. Okay, now keep in mind. Her practice is a little different than mine because she attracts people with difficult to treat Morgellons. So it's skewed towards the more complicated people, all right? Um, in terms of what works on this is, so anyhow, Morgellons, everyone, is I, I, what I think is a skin manifestation of, of Lyme and Bartonella. That's what I believe. And she alludes to that in some of her writings as well, too. and. In it, people have a lot of um, itching, sometimes prickly kind of feelings of their skin. They'll get little keratin plugs under the skin, so these nodules that hurt. Some people develop black fiber that come out of these lesions. And um, and the, the and when you look at, you actually do, um, uh, you look at these fibers, they appear to be accumulations of keratin um, and collagen, basically, okay? They're not actually a germ. Although some people have tended to use things like ivermectin as an antiparasitic to treat these things, there's no laboratory evidence that says these are parasite infections, okay? Now, the one thing I wanna let you know, regardless of what you treat your Bartonella with or regardless of what you treat your Borrelia with, sometimes it's just a matter of time. I know you've been treating, it looks like since mid 2023, okay? When we look at how long it takes to recover from these different germs, let me give you some, what I've seen in my practice, okay? So in my practice, when somebody has Borrelia alone, okay, not with Bartonella, not with Babesia, but just Borrelia alone, an average length of treatment can be one to two years, all right? So it takes time, all right? There was a study done one time looking at how long it would take you to start feeling better if you had just Borrelia alone. And in that study, people were put on two antibiotics. Um, one was um, clarithromycin and another one was metronidazole, all right? And in that study, by three months, 30% of people started having some improvement. That means by three months, 70% of people had had no improvement yet, okay? By six months, 60% of people started having improvements. That means that 40% were not seeing any benefit yet at all. By nine months, 90%, okay? 
So that means that by nine months, 10% of people have gotten nowhere with treatment, all right? So the one thing to be clear about this is um, it takes time, all right? Now, Bartonella, for about 85% of people, you can get over it usually within about four to six months. There are 15% of people, in my experience, that it becomes a chronic infection that just takes time. And regrettably, it just takes time, all right? Now, if we look at data from a group called MyLyme Data, looking at how to get over tick-borne infections and Lyme disease, what their data says is that there, so MyLyme Data is um, run by a group called LymeDisease.org out of California. And they have um, enrolled about 16,000 people now in their database. To get in their database, you have to sign up, you fill out a questionnaire with a number of things, and then periodically they'll go back to their database and pick a group of people to ask further questions, all right? So about four or five years, I think maybe four years ago now, they asked the question, what did it take to get you well, all right? And and people, you know, what they've discovered is it wasn't ozone baths, it wasn't um, um, IV vitamin C, it wasn't a bunch of alternative therapies, okay? What it, what it was is three key things. Number one, using antibiotics, all right, to get over your tick-borne infections. And they didn't break down into whether, they didn't ask, they didn't clarify with people as to whether herbal antibiotics were effective at all or not too, okay? But using antibiotics. Number two, treating for at least a year or more, all right? And number three, working with a Lyme literate doctor who can help weave in and out of all the intricacies here, okay? So um, I, I'm not gonna go through point by point what what Ginger Safely does, because I, I may or may not agree with him, besides I need to go through some other questions here. But th the point is, is that it probably is, for the majority of people, this probably is a manifestation of tick-borne infections. And from what you've already said, it's gonna be, it's gonna take time. And I will also let you know, I generally don't find benefit of topicals. I have found benefit in using either oral herbal antibiotics that target Bartonella and um, Borrelia or um, prescription antibiotic combinations that target those. And it's just a matter of time. You just gotta stay with it basically, okay? All right, um, good luck to you, Jessica. Let's see here. All right. Hello, Maria. Let's see here. I've been diagnosed with Lyme, Bartonella, Babesia, Epstein Barr, and Mold. I'm trying to figure out which of these is causing my primary symptoms to adjust treatment. My primary symptoms are left side of neck, head pain left side of face, jaw tingling, throbbing, left neck, lymph node swelling, inner ear throbbing, sore heels of feet, fatigue. When off doxy, I additionally get depression, ongoing anxiety, and occasionally night sweats. For over a year, I have been taking Buner's herbal protocol, cytokine supplements, and two 100 milligram doxycyclines, and recently added methylene blue. The doxy helps my symptoms the most. I have read your thoughts on vibrant tests. Do you feel it's worth retesting with Igenix? Or have any thoughts on where to go with my treatment? I have tried several times to stop taking the doxy, but feel worse after three to eight days. My doctor has prescribed me um, pyrimethamine and hydroxychloroquine, but I tried each only for a couple of days because they made me feel so terrible. Okay. So Maria, I'm not going to be able to figure out what exactly is the best thing for you to take because that would be, that, that is something I figure out a doctor's visit where I spend an hour and a half with a person trying to look at their symptoms in detail, trying to review what they've tried and the benefits that they've had, okay? And I can't tell based on the symptoms you've written here, which of your germs is most active. I just, I can't tell, unfortunately, okay? Um Let me see if there's anything else I can say here. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you good advice because this is this is a really complicated situation. This is where I would need to sit and talk with you, and, and we can't do it in this format. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Maria. Hello, Jenny Levine. Thank you so much for being here for us. You're welcome. A 52 year old female history of being very athletic and fit, lifelong insomnia, history, histamine issues, 45 year old hips, hurt 51 year old, both hips replaced, body aches and cracks developed, mast cell activation syndrome, and severe MCS one year ago, loud pulsing tinnitus. For years, extreme pressure in head, photosensitive ears clogged, hoarse voice on and off, eye floaters for years, hospitalized at six years old for serious unknown virus. Been searching for my problem and diagnosed today with a Quest Immunobot positive for uh, 41 IgG Lyme antibody, the IgM 23 reactive, 41 reactive, CD57 super low. Doctor says we will start minocycline. Do you recommend any other supplements? Japanese knotweed crypto. I'm very sad. I feel this is ruining my joints, my life, and I'm uh, highly motivated to get well. Okay, so the um, Quest Immunoblot would be better called a Western blot, okay? It's not the same Immunoblot technique that um, Igenix does, all right? So let me just give you some definitions here. So the, although they call it Immunoblot, the method is called a Western blot. So what they do in a Western blot is they grow germs in the lab, they kill them, they take the proteins from these germs, and then they put them at the bottom of a, of a test strip, and then they run electricity through the test strip. And what that electricity does is it carries the proteins based on their weight into a different part of the test strip. So all the proteins that weigh 41 kilodaltons fall out in the middle. All the ones that weigh 23 kilodaltons will usually fall out right at the beginning. Okay, so those numbers are the weights of the proteins, okay? On um, the IgM Western blot that you had done, when you have a positive 23 and a positive 41, that counts as a positive test, all right? Now, some doctors that are not familiar with Lyme disease would try to say that's a false positive test. And the reason they would say that is you've been sick for a number of years. You're not supposed to keep making IgM antibodies after a number of years. The way that antibodies work is when you first get sick with an infection, it's IgMs you make. And then usually by um, six weeks to three months, IgMs are supposed to go away and get replaced by IgGs, all right? What's interesting, though, is in Borrelia, Lyme infection, about 50% of the time, it appears that IgMs don't go away, and we don't know why. And it does give you solid evidence, though, that you have had that infection in you, and it still may be in you, basically, okay? Um, the all right, so the one thing I want to let you know, if you've got a lot of these symptoms, it's possible, in addition to Lyme, you might have picked up some other tick-borne infections at the same time. And the lab that would give you the best ability to look for those other infections is Igenix. It's a private lab. Um, it can be a little bit more expensive. Your insurance probably won't pay for it but it will give you answers. And I think based on some of the symptoms you've said here, I would also want to know, especially with the tinnitus that you're having, which is an, and joint involvement, beyond just um, Borrelia, I would want to know about Bartonella as well too. And as I said earlier tonight, on one of the earlier questions, the best test, I believe, for Bartonella would be to get a um, immunoblot method through um, Igenix for both IgM and IgGs. The IgM in Bartonella also appears to stay positive in a very small percentage of people, even beyond the chronic period. Okay, that test, of course, is going to cost you four hundred fifty dollars to get it done, but it's a valid test. It'll give you information. All right. In terms of what is the best thing to take for you at this point? Let me just 
say one other thing here. Oh, the other thing is, so also I'm thinking Bartonella because of the photosensitivity, the tinnitus, the um, those kind of symptoms. But you might also, to be thorough, I would suggest also looking at getting a urine test uh, for mold toxicity to make sure that you are not one of 25% of people that when they breathe in uh, mold toxins from moldy environments, uh, that you're not one of those 25% of people that get trapped in you because mold toxicity also can give you a lot of the sensitivity and um, uh, some of the sensitivities you're describing here as well too. All right, so I would suggest that as well too. All right, now, when it comes to treating for um, Borrelia, minocycline, is a good choice to start with. If you're gonna go with a prescription antibiotic, it will be useful at treating two forms of Lyme. It's gonna be useful at treating for um, the spirochete form of Lyme. That's the, the appearance where it looks like a corkscrew. It's also gonna treat another appearance of uh, Lyme Borrelia that lives inside your cells, all right? But we recognize that there's also a third state, which is called a microscopic cyst state. And so uh, minocycline doesn't treat that microscopic cyst state, okay? In addition, we now recognize over the last five years that these spirochetes, cyst, and maybe even intracellular Lyme can exist in a growing state. That's what the majority of them are, they're growing, but that also there's a small percent that move into a hibernating state, we call those persisters, okay? And there isn't, uh, minocycline won't touch that either, okay? you could add in either a Japanese knotweed or a cryptolepis. You don't need to use both, okay? Because the crypto and the knotweed will pick up uh, growing and persister bar, um, uh, Borrelia. They also pick up growing and persister um, Bartonella as well too. And probably for Lyme, they're gonna pick up the cyst form as well too. Minnow, also can treat Bartonella too. So if you you if there is the possibility of Bartonella, I mean again I would probably test to make sure you have it. But if you go with a minnow and either a knotweed or or a crypto, you basically have covered uh, growing and persister Lyme and Bartonella, and you've picked up all the forms of Lyme, and you've picked up uh, Bartonella on the growing side and the persister side as well too. Okay, all right. All right, in addition, you should take a look at my Lyme protocol where I outline um, the essential things you should take in addition to your germ killers, all right? Let me go do that with you here right now. We'll, we'll look at it together. I'm gonna do a screen share here. All right, so this is my uh, information site, Treat Lyme by Marty Ross, MD. All right, and if you look in um, on this main navigation menu up above here, there's my Lyme protocol. And it'd probably be better off if I just called it tick-borne infection protocol, but I call it my Lyme protocol, all right? So over here on this right-hand column, there is all these things that I think are important to address, all right? So number one, get sleep. There's diet that can be helpful. You want to lower inflammation chemicals called cytokines. I also suggest people be on an herb that supports uh, their bodies under stress. In addition, can help out with hormones. The people be on a multivitamin, um, that they do treat yeast if it's overgrowing in their intestines, and then I give you recommendations on how to treat Lyme and Bartonella too, okay? All right, so you could literally just walk through this. So I suggest people get seven to nine hours of sleep a night, okay? That helps restore your immune system and it helps you feel better. It helps you, it helps decrease pain. I give both supplements and prescription options here, okay? Uh, for diet, I recommend being on an anti-inflammatory diet, which could either be uh, a paleo type diet um, or if you're reacting to all kinds of things, I suggest doing an elimination diet. And I talk about both of those here, all right? To lower inflammation chemicals called cytokines that are made in excess in these disorders, I recommend using curcumin, 
or being on a combination product that has some curcumin, resveratrol, back tea extract, and N-acetylcysteine in it, okay? Anyhow, you can keep working through each of these sections and you'll see what I recommend, but I recommend doing things up through step 12 here, all of them, okay? So I wanna let you know that when you treat these disorders, it is not as simple as just killing the germs. You have to support your body and the immune system taking all those steps that I just outlined to get over this stuff, okay? All right. Um, good luck to you, Jenny. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dr. Ross. It's good to be here again. Oh, well, welcome back then. Um, learning from you. Thank you for these webinars. My adult son has chronic uh, tick-borne relapsing fever. Uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, I think is what you mean by BB. Um, Ehrlichia and Babesia and has terrible time sleeping. His awake time is in the middle of the night and his downtime is daylight, but not always. Sometimes he cannot sleep for days. Is this usual? What can be done to help with sleep? All right. So he's got alteration in his sleep-wake cycle for sure, okay? And um, you could, so we ha so the way, what I usually will wind up doing is trying to step back. Let me see what his sleep time is here. All right, so what I have found helpful in my practice is to use <coughs> melatonin to help reset the sleep cycle. And so what you can do is try to use melatonin about, take about three milligrams of mel melatonin about two, one, one to two hours before your planned sleep time, all right? So if he currently is going to sleep, let's say he falls asleep at eight in the morning <clears throat> and you want to try to gradually start shifting that backwards so it happens more at nighttime, what you could do is instead of eight o'clock, try to target seven o'clock that he would fall asleep, all right? And you would take your melatonin beginning at about 5 a.m., all right? And about every week or so, you try to shift this back by about an hour. <coughs> that is what I've been able to do working with some of my patients to help change that sleep cycle. All right. Um, give it a try and see. It may or may not work, but that's what I have worked with with some success in some of my patients. Okay. All right. Good luck, Joe. Good luck to your son. Excuse me, everyone. <coughs> it's uh, allergy time for me here in Texas, so <laughs> sometimes it really gets stirred up. All right, let's see here. Hi, Michelle. Let's see. Thank you for all you do. You're welcome. Currently treating Lyme and BART with Crypto Plus. Japanese knotweed, azithromycin, um, baluki, along with many supplements. My question is, are the killers and busters hitting every form of Lyme and Bart? Some of the terminology can be confusing and just with to make sure it's a good plan to cover all the forms. Okay, so as I was saying earlier with um, Lyme, we have to be concerned about hitting all three appearances, or you can call those forms, okay, which would be spirochete, a form that lives inside of the cells, intracellular, or you can call that the L form, and then a cyst form, okay? And then these forms, these appearances can either be growing or they can be hibernating, or we'll call those hibernators persisters, okay? All right. Bartonella only has one appearance, but it can be growing or it can be hibernating or persisting, okay? So in terms of covering the persisters forms of Lyme and also the one form of BART, 
the thing that would pick up persisters is the Cryptolepis in the Crypto Plus and the Japanese um, knotweed would be doing that as well too, okay? All right. Then the a um, <clears throat> the crypto and the knotweed and the azithromycin would pick up growing Bartonella and would also pick up growing lime. The crypto and Japanese knotweed would pick up growing lime in all three of those states or, or forms, okay? The azithromycin is only good against growing uh, spirochete lime and growing uh, intracellular lime. It also picks up growing Bartonella as well too, all right? So, so, so to, clear, to be clear, your current treatment is hitting growing and persister Bartonella in the one form that it exists in and growing and persister lime in all three forms that it exists in. Okay, so yes, you got that covered. The Baluki is useful at helping to strip out biofilms, which is a slime layer that covers the germ, okay? And in addition, we think that um, Bartna has the ability to weave itself in your uh, blood clotting protein called fibrin, and we call the creating something called fibrin nest. And the Baluki helps break down the fibrin in those fibrin nests too. All right. So to be clear, I think you got everything covered. All right. To answer your question there. All right. All right. Good luck to you, Michelle. Hello, Molly. I see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I started having muscle pain seven months ago and tested positive for Babesia and Bartonella three months ago. My symptoms are, my symptoms were and still are muscle and joint pain and swollen sore feet. For the last three months, I have been on azithromycin, rifampin, nystatin, hydroxychloroquine, and herbal supplements. I started pulsing artemisinin a month ago, like you suggested in your article. I have also been on methylene blue for one and a half months and Bactrim for a month. I started lumbar kinase this week. Two questions. How long should I pulse the artemisinin? And I still have all the same symptoms I had when I started treatment. I have to take two Aleve every day to be able to walk. How do we know if the meds are working? My crazy high inflammation on my blood work has significantly gone down, but I still have all the same symptoms of pain and swelling. The only time I had any relief since symptom onset was when I was on prednisone for a short time. Is there something other than a leave that will be... All right, so I don't, the the, the second, uh, last part of your question did not show up here, but let me put, let me post your question again here. All right, so, all right, so Molly, um, bear with me, I just wanna look back through part of this again. Okay, so, I'm just gonna make a comment, okay? I know you have tested positive for Babesia and Bartonella. Um, I also suspect you have Borrelia here, even if you tested negative for it, all right? When you have this degree of, of joint pain and muscle pain, usually um, Borrelia is also involved there. The good news is the things that you have been taking in addition to covering for Bartonella are also going to be very useful at treating for Borrelia too. So you got it covered, okay, all right? The reason I am giving you that kind of information is as I suggested earlier, Borrelia can take a lot of time to start turning a corner. So again, the statistics I reviewed you with you earlier is that one study showed that by three months, only 30% of people with Borrelia start having improvements when they're on antibiotics. By six months, 60% of people start having improvements. And by nine months, 90% of people start having improvements. Okay, so for Borrelia, it can take time, all right? 
Bartonella, if you are on a treatment that is effective and working, usually by around two to three months in, you should start seeing some lifting of Bartonella symptoms, all right? So symptoms that we attribute more to Bartonella than the other infections would be pain on the soles of the feet. Um, ongoing anxiety could be part of that. Uh, air hunger can be part of Bartonella, but also can be part of um, Babesia. Um, uh, neurologic symptoms like numbness and tingling can be both Bartonella and Lyme, but if they start getting better, that means you're probably on a good Bartonella treatment as well too, all right? For Babesia, symptoms that can, off oh, and the lymph nodes can also be part of Bartonella as well too, all right? So you wanna start seeing are some of those symptoms lifting, all right? In terms of Babesia, to be honest with you, you haven't really done much in the way of a Babesia treatment here. Um, the hydroxychloroquine uh, can, is an anti-malarial that sometimes people use for Babesia, but it's very weak. And you only recently, it looks like, added in artemisinin. And by itself, artemisinin is probably not going to be enough to get rid of your Babesia. All right. So herbally, the two, the if you're going to try to go after Babesia herbally, the primary herb I recommend is Cryptolepis. And I usually have people dose it up to a teaspoonful three times a day. If that is not adjusting symptoms by about two months, then I would add in artemisinin under the pulse dose, okay? And you usually are going to treat Babesia, even as the symptoms get better, for at least five months. So to answer that part of your question, all right? Now, there are stronger prescriptive ways of going after Babesia. And uh, I generally break the two ways of going after Babesia into protocols that are designed around either atovaquone, which is also known as Mepron or Malarone, or treatments that are based around what are called quinolines, which would be something called uh, tefenoquin or primaquin, all right? And I call those my tier one treatments. You may want to talk to your doctor who has been designing your treatment about getting a little bit more aggressive against Babesia because at this point it doesn't look like you're making much improvement and maybe it's the Babesia that's holding you back, okay? Let me show you my Babesia article so you can see how I break these kind of options down for you. All right, so take a look at um, my infection treatment plan section here, and then look at um, this article called Kills Babesia, A Brief Guide. And in this article, you're gonna see that I talk about, I break my, I say that you have to use combinations of anti-malarials to cure Babesia, okay? The tier one options that I offer are your strongest, and they're either going to be what I call atovaquone-based treatments, or they're going to be quinoline-based treatments, okay? All right. And I, I talk in here about how do you build an atovaquone-based treatment. So for instance, you can one option is to use atovaquone proquinol combinations, a drug called malarone. It's a pill. And then you would want to combine it with either azithromycin, clarithromycin, doxycycline or minocycline. Okay, that's an idea of one, all right? Down here, I talk about either using primaquin or tefenoquin as a basis of a treatment. These are called quinolines, and I talked to you about how do you build those kind of treatments too, all right? When it comes to the tier two treatments, I give these slight less chance of working. The primary herb that I recommend for Babesia is the cryptolepis. And then I suggest you can also use artemisinin, but I'll be honest, um, I usually would start with crypto first. And if people are not making much advancement by one to two months, then I would add in the artemisinin, okay? All right. All right. Well, I hope I, that gives you some information there. And uh, good luck. Oh, so in terms of your inflammation and getting that under control, so the um, 
a leave is going to primarily focus on uh, inflammatory chemicals that are in a family called prostaglandin type inflammatory chemicals. All right. The kind of inflammatory chemicals you're having, though, because of tick-borne infections are primarily of a, a family or group called cytokines. And the Aleve is not necessarily the best way to do that. What I like using to lower cytokines is, is would be two major things. Number one, curcumin, uh, which is a component of the Indian seasoning turmeric. And you can buy capsules of curcumin. If you're going to do it, you want to make sure you're getting a liposomal variety, which means it's curcumin microscopically wrapped in fat to help increase the absorption of the curcumin into the bloodstream. And the product I like for that is a product by Thorne called, uh, used to be called Mariva 500, and they now call it curcumin phytosome. And it's a, you want to take 500 milligrams um, three times a day. Okay. In addition, and what, what curcumin does is it gets inside of your white blood cells and limits their production of cytokines. Okay. Because it's the white blood cells in response to infection that manufacture all these cytokines. All right. So, the curcumin gets into the factory and shuts down the factory partially, all right? But what you also can do to be stronger is to try to block um, the instructions that tell the white blood cells to make uh, cytokines from even getting there. And what, what instructs white blood cells to make cytokines is excess oxidation agents in your blood, all right? And so you wanna lower those oxidation agents. And one of the best ways to do that is to use glutathione. Uh, glutathione is a very powerful antioxidant made in every one of our cells. It helps deliver with detox. It helps repair damage inside of our cells. And if we're sick for a while, sometimes we exhaust our glutathione supplies, okay? So um, I like a liposomal variety of glutathione. Also, the reason you wanna go with a liposomal form of glutathione is that um, glutathione can be easily destroyed in your stomach unless there's something to help protect it so that it'll get absorbed, okay? And the product I like for that is a product made by Research Nutritionals. And that product is called Trifortify. And I usually have people take a teaspoonful once a day. So as an alternative to leave, you could start taking curcumin, that curcumin phytosome by Thorne, 500 milligrams three times a day. And, and then also add in the Trifortify glutathione I was describing as a teaspoon a day, okay? All right. Let me just do a quick screen share here for you. All right, so let's see here. All right, so this is Marty Ross MD supplement. So like when I talk about curcumin, if you're wondering which curcumin do I recommend because uh, you know, my store is is based on products I used with my patients in my Seattle practice. These are products I have a lot of experience working with. I know that they can have benefit. I've also researched these manufacturers to make sure they're good manufacturers, that they are actually using the most active quality ingredients, okay? So basically, I curate the best options for you for supplements. There's a lot of supplement garbage out there. If you're going to use supplements, you want to make sure you're using good quality products that have a chance of working. I've kind of taken the guesswork out of it for you by, by putting together this store, okay? Secondly, you could order from me, and the, op the benefits of ordering from me are the products I carry here I offer at the lowest price allowed by the manufacturers. If I offered them any lower, they would stop letting me sell them, okay? Number two... I pay for shipping if your order is over $50. And number three, I cover your taxes if there are taxes, okay? So I try to make it more affordable that way, all right? In terms of the curcumin product that I was talking about, it's this curcumin phytosome product uh, made by um, Thorne, okay? And then in terms of the glutathione, that was that product called Trifortify. And this is, uh, we currently have, um, there are Trifortify, there's a, a tube with orange flavor. There's another one that's watermelon flavor. And these tubes will last at least 48 doses. The 
boxes are single dose packets that you can buy as well too. All right, anyhow, there you go. Good luck to you, Molly. Thanks for the question. Hello, Rosie. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. You've been such a lifesaver with your direction on the herbal protocols. You are so patient to explain all of this to us. I'm sorry for the loss of your mother and hope you get dad all taken care of. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's uh, many, I don't know if many of you know, but um, beginning in January for about 10 days, my mother um, got uh, bacteria pneumonia after COVID and eventually did pass away. And the last, um, at the end of that process, the, the night before she died, my dad decided to have a stroke and a heart attack. And um, I had to fly from Indiana out to Colorado Springs to help him. I am glad to report, I think my mom is in a good place and I'm getting in a good place about that too. I'm um, having some grief around that. Dad has actually made an astounding <laughs> recovery from his stroke and his heart attack. Um, he um, is probably back to about 95, 97% of his baseline is just making astounding recovery um, daily. He's uh, mainly walking with the help of his roller at this point and is starting to be able to bathe on his own again. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm coming through this, but thank you for your well wishes there. I appreciate that. And he's coming through it too. All right, so on to your question. And so my question, if I'm on the Lyme protocol of doxy and herbs and they are prescribing another antibiotic for an infection in my mouth or other issues, how do I handle that? Thank you so much. Uh, so the um, you, you can take the additional antibiotic they're giving you for oral infection. They're probably gonna be looking at doing something called clindamycin, also known as cleosin, or they might be looking at doing Augmentin, also known, uh, or amoxicillin, or something called amoxicillin clavulanic acid, all right? Now, I want to let you know all of those drugs I just said, the clindamycin and the um, Augmentin and the amoxicillin um, can kill the spirochete form of Lyme. So you may get some additional die-off reaction, but... Um, they do not treat intracellular Lyme like the doxy does treat the intracellular Lyme, for instance, okay? So you can add whatever they're giving you for, and they may even be using something called cephalosporins in your, for your oral infection too. You can add those to what you're currently doing. Just be aware you're likely to get a Herxheimer reaction from this, okay? All right. Um, good luck to you, Rosie. Oh, before I forget, so everyone, you probably know this, but a Herxheimer reaction, when you start, um, uh, Herxheimer is a reaction that can occur about 85% of the time. There's about 15% of people that don't get Herxheimer reactions. And in a Herxheimer reaction, what happens is you get worse, all right? And the reason you get worse is um, when you start killing germs with an antibiotic, um, the immune system sees the dead bug parts and manufactures more of those inflammatory chemicals called cytokines I mentioned a few times tonight, all right? So cytokines um, are good and bad. They're made by your, your white blood cells when they see an infection or they see a toxin in you. And their purpose is to turn the immune system on to deal with that problem. But in such, certain situations like mold toxicity or in chronic Lyme infection, chronic tick-borne infections, the immune system doesn't do a good job getting rid of these problems and it eventually uh, tries harder and harder and eventually makes too many cytokines, all right? And it's too many cytokines that give you fatigue, make it so you can't think, uh, make you hurt all over, give you neurologic dysfunction, interrupt with how your hormones work, uh, disturb your sleep, anyhow. All those symptoms we call mold toxicity symptoms and Lyme disease symptoms, they're excess cytokine symptoms, all right? So now, if you start killing germs and the immune system reacts to the dead bug parts by making more cytokines, your all of your symptoms should get worse, okay? That's what a Herxheimer reaction is, all right? Now, you'll get a Herx either when you first introduce an antibiotic or you increase the dose of the antibiotic or you put a new antibiotic in, okay? So that's why I mentioned the Herx here potential, okay? All right, um, good luck to you. Hello, Anna. Hold on here just a minute. All 
All right, let's see here. Um, so Anna says, thank you for offering these weekly webinars. Quick three-part question. I'm a New Jersey resident getting Igenix testing done on Monday. I know you recommend IgG and IgM Immunobot for Lyme, Babesian Bartonella. I also want to test for anaplasma, ehrlichiosis, and tick-borne uh, relapsing fever, et cetera. Do you suggest the Igenix tick-borne disease panel uh, for IBL or 5-IBL or 6-IBL or 11-L? <coughs> also, would CETBD culture enhanced PCR test panel be recommended over immunoblot or in addition to it? While I keep my symptoms more manageable, I will trigger symptoms before Monday's Igenix test. How do I calm the symptoms down after the test so I am in the pain, not in pain for days or even weeks? All right, so at this point, so Igenix has come up with, um, so there's two major ways that Igenix now is testing for infections. One is the immunoblot method, which I described earlier, which is basically um, looking to see if you're, a method to see if your immune system is making antibodies against proteins found on these tick-borne infections, okay? The other method is to do a genetic test to see if you have the genetic material of these infections in you and to see, um, to improve the ability to see if you have that genetic material, they try to culture your blood first to grow more of the germs so that you can get, uh, have more DNA to test for, okay? All right. The problem with these uh, enhanced PCR test methods is we don't know how sensitive they are at finding the infection. Um, so although they're looking to see if you really have the infection in you, the problem is you need to have germs swimming by your needles at the moment you draw the blood. And Borrelia doesn't really live in the blood that easily. Babesia can, but Bartonella may or may not live in the blood that easily either. So um, you may miss a lot of infection doing the enhanced test, okay? Also, if you've mentioned something here You said you will trigger symptoms before Monday's hygienic test. I just want to talk about that. So one way to trigger more symptoms is to kill germs. So do you use herbal antibiotics or prescriptions before you get the test done? Okay. Because as you do that, um, the body, the immune system will kill germs and release those germ parts into the bloodstream where the immune system can have a stronger reaction and make more antibodies. All right. The problem, if you do that type of an antibiotic challenge, to make yourself feel worse, you're lowering your germ load before you do an enhanced PCR test, all right? So if you wanna do the enhanced PCR test, just be aware, if you do antibiotics before that test, you've decreased your ability to test for it, okay? So because I still think that the immunoblot is more sensitive at detecting infection if it's there, I would go with the immunoblot I would not go with this new fancy enhanced PCR method that Igenix is using at this point. I believe the immunoblot has a better chance of finding infection if it's there, okay? That's what I would suggest for you, okay? All right, um, let me talk a little bit more about immunoblot too. So for um, so the, the technique of the immunoblot is that Igenix has uh, taken proteins from the various germs they're testing for and they, um, the, what they're doing is they've actually programmed bacteria in their lab to grow these proteins, and they've modified the proteins that are grown. They've modified the proteins to remove pieces that would falsely hold on to antibodies made against uh, virus infections or other infections. So they've cleaned up these proteins to only hold on to antibodies made against Borrelia or antibodies made against Bartonella, or antibodies made against Babesia, all right? So that's what makes it, one of the things that makes it a better test is there's less chance of a false positive, all right? Number two, on the um, uh, uh, Borrelia Lyme immunoblot, they're looking to see if you have antibodies against eight kinds of Borrelia compared to the PAC lab, LabCorp, CDC approved method of only looking to see antibodies against one, okay? 
And then on the Bartonella side, they're looking to see if you have antibodies against four specific strains and then the genus. And that collectively means they're testing to see if you have antibodies against 15 strains. All right. And on the Babesia, we think there can be upwards of maybe 15 to 20 strains of Babesia as well, too. And because they do a genus test, as well as they test for two specific strains, they're picking up all of those 15 to 22 strains. Okay. That's why I recommend them. All right. Um, good luck to you on the test. Hello, John. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. After years of antibiotics, I developed a fungal nail infection in all my toenails. Happily, no stomach problems, just chronic constipation. I take extra magnesium for. Does this fungus potentially disseminate further through the body and cause problems? I took fluconazole a few years ago with no problems, so I don't think I am allergic. Does the fact that I herx from fluconazole now and have to take a lower dose mean that it is helping? Is it likely that I have yeast because I react to fluconazole or what else might be it killing and causing cytokines from? I don't crave sugar, eat very little because it makes me feel worse, constipation from yeast or mold or something else. All right. So keep in mind fluconazole, which is, you know, was originally designed to treat uh, yeast, um, vaginal yeast, and eventually we can use it for intestinal yeast overgrowth. We also know that it can treat the cyst form of Lyme and it can treat um, uh, growing and persister Bartonella, all right? So if you have a Herx from it, it doesn't prove you have yeast. It could be something else, all right? So in terms of looking to see if you have yeast, you've kind of gone through some of the symptoms, but um, the key symptoms to look at is, do you have um, sugar cravings? Um, do you get worse if you have sugar? Do you feel worse all over if you have sugar? Um, do you have intestinal gassiness or bloating? Um, the other thing that yeast can sometimes uh, cause is um, they'll release toxins into your, that get absorbed into the bloodstream and those toxins then interact with the skin. And at the level of the skin, those toxins lead to uh, pimples and acne and even worsened uh, eczema and even psoriasis, for instance. So you're having worsening skin rashes. And then finally, sometimes if you get too many yeast in your intestines, you also get too many yeast up here in your food pipe. And it can feel like things are catching or you have difficulty swallowing because your food pipe isn't working correctly. So that's something else to think about too. But if you're pretty much negative on all those questions, then it's possible that your fluconazole is killing something else. And the, from a tick-borne infection standpoint, those two potentials could be um, Borrelia or they could be Bartonella, okay? Now, fluconazole is not the best uh, toenail fungus killer. So that toenail fungus is a external infection. It's not in you. It's it's um, on sandwiched between the toe and the skin below the toe, basically, or tone, I'm sorry, toenail and the skin below the toenail. All right. So it's there. It's not systemic. It's there. But you need to get something there. OK. And what tends to work better for doing that are two antifungals. One is called uh, Lamisole, uh, which is also known as terbinafine or um, Fluconazole, also no, or I'm sorry, um, itraconazole, also known as Sporinax. Okay, so those are some options you might want to discuss with your physician about too. Okay, all right. Good luck to you, John. Carolina, let's see. Hello. First, thank you for all you do for this community. Um, you're welcome. Let's see, I have been on antibiotics for over three years on and off. Every time I try a different approach, like taking herb or getting mold, I get worse. Then I had to go back on antibiotics. My symptoms are neurologic left side of my body. I feel like my left arm is being twisted and nerve pain. My stomach feels the same. I get dizzy spells after the day. I am developing many food allergies. I still manage to eat very healthy. I follow all my doctor's recommendations. I feel like I can't get away from being sick, um, Carolina. So, uh, boy, it's hard to figure out where to jump in here. I'm, I'm sorry for what's happening with you. It's um, These illnesses can just be very difficult. 
I don't know all the advice to give you because I would actually need to interview you like we're doing a visit. And I, so I, I have limited information that you just described to me here. OK, the one thing um, that stands out to me, though, that I'll just make a comment about is the um, the fact that you're developing more many more food allergies. All right. There's two things that could be happening with you. Number one, it is possible that you have developed too many yeast in your intestines from having been on the antibiotics over time. And that um, having too many yeast is um, keeping you sick. It's, it, it actually is triggering your immune system to make too many cytokines, all right? The other thing that yeast overgrowth can do is it can lead to what is known as leaky gut, where your intestines, instead of having a nice barrier on the inside, start leaking uh, partially digested food into the immune system, and that triggers the immune system to start reacting. Um, so, and that may be where some of the food allergies are coming from. So let me talk about leaky gut here for a minute. So you have the inside of the intestines, and then you have one layer of cells that touches each other very tight, and then you have blood vessels and a bunch of immune cells, okay? So you've got inside of the intestines, one layer of cells that touches very tight, where there's no gaps. And then under here, you have blood vessels and you've got immune cells, all right? Now, in healthy functioning intestines, there's no gaps here. And, but if you start getting too many yeast living in your intestines, it can cause these cells that line the lining to kind of plump up and pull apart and you basically get gaps. And now instead of having, in the way, normally the way that things get to this side of your skin or the skin lining your intestines is that um, bacteria that lines um, your intestines does micro digestion of food, breaks it into small particles. And those small particles normally would get absorbed through your cells and then get passed into the blood vessels that go here, okay? And these micro digested foods would be broken into their fat parts, their protein parts, and um, their sugar parts in a way that's not recognizable as corn or beans or the original food source, okay? But if you've got intestinal yeast overgrowth and you've got these gaps, you now get partially digested corn and partially digested hot dogs and whatever it is you're eating, right? And they get through and, the, and they hit the immune cells that are here, triggering immune reaction or allergic reaction, all right? So... I would work with your physicians to figure out if you might have too many yeast. I'll show you an article that you can look at um, that I've written about how do you figure out if you have too many yeast, okay? Number two, regrettably, these infections sometimes trigger your, by these infections, I mean the tick-borne infections and even mold toxicity, sometimes trigger a type of immune cell that lives in us called mast cells to get too active. And we call that mast cell activation syndrome. Mast cells are your allergy cells, basically. All right. And it used to be the thing that we thought the only thing that would trigger a mast cell to be active is if you the thing you're allergic to, like a pollen or a cat dander, would land on your mast cell. And then that mast cell would uh, be activated to release histamines. Okay. We now know there's a number of other things that activate these mast cells. And Borrelia can do it. Bartonella can do it, Bambesia can do it, yeast can do it, everything can turn on these mast cells. And not only do they get irritated and more easily release their histamines, they also become manufacturing plants for cytokines that keep you feeling sick, all right? So one of the other things that you might wanna look at and talk to your doctor about is to help figure out if you might have mast cell activation and take steps to deal with that as well too, all right? So I'm gonna show you two articles to take a look at. Now, there may even be more going on with you. I just, I don't have a chance in this kind of a format uh, to interview you to come up with enough, uh, other ideas to give you better recommendations. But there's two things to think about that I'm mentioning for you here, okay? All right, let me do a quick screen share for you here. All right, so in my um, treat line by Marty Ross MD site, in my Lyme guide, 
in terms of the mast cell activation, look in my immune system chapter. And here is my article on mast cell activation syndrome, okay? Where I talk to you about how do you figure out if you have it and what do you do about it, all right? Okay, number two, um, oh, in terms of yeast, take a look at my yeast section here. And in this section, I have an article about how do you figure out if you have too many yeast and another article about what do you do if you have too many yeast, okay? So you can take a look at both of these and see if this is information you might even bring to your doctor to have them help you with too, all right? All right. All right, good luck to you. Hey, La, let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Is occipital pain a common symptom of Bartonella? In your experience, my doctor does not seem to think so, but my own experience and many other anecdotal conversations seem to suggest it's quite common. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily specific for Bartonella. People with Bartonella can get various kinds of head pains. The occipital pain can be one of those but I wouldn't say that it's only exclusive to Bartonella, for instance. And there's a lot of people that have Bartonella that don't have any occipital pain at all, all right? All right, um, good luck to you. Hello, Benjamin, let's see. Is inflammation in the jaw and TMJ a symptom of a specific co-infection? You know, it sometimes can be seen as part of Bartonella, but um, usually it's not gonna be just the TMJ uh, jaw symptoms that you're gonna have in isolation. You will have other symptoms that also suggest Bartonella, like pervasive anxiety, maybe mental health problems, pain on the soles of the feet. You might have a stretch mark, scratch mark type rash pattern that sometimes is seen in Bartonella. Sometimes people have air hunger. Sometimes they have severe cognitive impairment. Um, you would be seeing other symptoms suggesting Bartonella, of which TMJ would be another symptom, but TMJ by itself is not, and jaw pain is not diagnostic of Bartonella, okay? All right, thanks for your question, Benjamin. Hi, Benjamin, let's see. Um, do you have any tips on titrating low-dose naltrexone to the proper target dose? All right, so uh, naltrexone, everyone, is a, yeah, I give you some ideas. So uh, many of you may or may not be aware of naltrexone. Naltrexone is a drug that is a narcotic blocker and we some, uh, or endorphin receptor narcotic blocker we sometimes use it in drug addictions and in alcoholism um, to treat it. At low doses, it actually helps modulate your immune system to balance it out so it's less inflammatory. It also can bind to mast cells, making them less reactive. And it can be quite useful at fibromyalgia pain by binding to a cell in your brain called micro, microglia. Okay. All right. That's a quick summary. Uh, we're kind of coming down towards the end of the webinar. So I'm, I'm not giving you a big explanation, but I'll show you all an article. You can read more about low dose naltrexone in a minute. All right. So um, low dose naltrexone, I usually like to start people at 1.5 milligrams daily, and I'll have them take it for two weeks. Then after two weeks, I'll have them go up to 3.0 milligrams daily. And um, after two more weeks, I'll go up to 4.5. All right. Now, I have people take it in the morning. The reason I have taken it in the morning is if people take it at night, it often gives them insomnia. Okay. There is an occasional person that will have nausea or GI side effects from being on low dose naltrexone. And there's another group of people sometimes that have a lot of brain cloudiness or fogginess too. If you are a person that is having the brain fogginess or cloudiness issues, what I usually will do is instead of having a person take it in the morning, I may have them take it at night. And instead of starting at a 1.5 milligram dose, I might start at a half milligram dose. 
and increase by 0.5 milligrams um, per day, the dose per day um, by 0.5 milligrams every two weeks until I find a level that actually triggers the side effects and then I back it down to the last dose. So although ideally I like to try to get people to 4.5 milligrams, there are some people you can only get up to 0.5 or maybe even 0.1 or 0.2 milligrams. And so if you're really reactive to it, you might start down at 0.5 milligrams. I've even had to start as low as 0.1 milligram with a person before. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, Benjamin. All right, let's see here. I'll take one more from Benjamin here. So Benjamin says, and finally, I've been feeling, seeing marked improvement from extended dry fasting. I feel like this integrated into your work could easily be beneficial. I'm going to a retreat with a Russian doctor named Sergey Felonov in March to do a nine day medical dry fast. Mother side treatment while I'm there to be quick, there is a book called Starving to Heal by Michelle Slater. She healed her lion with nine day dry fast with this doctor. Is this anything you have looked into? So um, I've looked into fasting as an extended fast, medical fast, where somebody is supporting you as a means of helping uh, with something called um, uh, helping to deal with something called cell senescence and also to help deal with um, another cellular process called um, autophagy. So what happens is if you starve yourself, it can lead to a process called autophagy where your cells start to cannibalize uh, inactive parts and then they'll repackage these inactive parts into active components. So it's a way of cleaning house in your cells in a sense, okay? Secondly, um, as a result of having Lyme and toxins, sometimes your cells go into a rest and they stop replicating. Those become what are known as senescent cells. And those senescent cells um, start becoming uh, factories of cytokine production, all right? And so fasting, extended fasting, is one way to get rid of those senescent cells and thereby get rid of all this inflammation that they're creating. So in terms of helping with Lyme, it's not gonna be a way that's gonna kill the germs, but rather it may be dealing with manifestations of, of, of cell debris um, building up and senescent cells building up. And by clearing them out, it can be the final trick that gets somebody all the way well, okay? All right. I'm actually planning on writing an article about both those concepts here eventually, but that's just kind of a quick summary of it. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question. I want to do a quick screen share here too, to show you all the article that I have on um, low dose naltrexone. All right, so take a look at my Lyme guide again and, and take a look in the immune system chapter. And right here, this is my article on the ins and outs of low-dose naltrexone side effects and why you might even want to consider using low-dose naltrexone, okay? All right, let's see here. Next question is from JC. Hi, JC. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I'm an 18 year old and got sick in September. In December, I tested positive for tularemia. As of last week, my tularemia test was negative, but my Lyme and Ehrlichia were positive. My bilirubin are low and white count is high. My symptoms include fever severe nausea, weight loss, pneumonia, fatigue chills, body pain, severe stomach pain, recurrent kidney infections, heartache and rashes, or headache and rashes. I've been on multiple rounds of many different antibiotics. My current doctor is at a standstill and wanting to take a step back from this. And I'm currently waiting to get to an infectious disease. I also travel the country to see livestock 
and I'm constantly around livestock. I'm still very sick to the point where I can't function some days. What are your thoughts on my situation? Is there anything I can do while waiting? And is there anything for sure that I need to discuss with the infectious disease doctor? So, um, Okay, so you've got positive testing for Lyme and Ehrlichia. Okay, so um, obviously this is a complex problem. And in a brief webinar on the internet, I can't diagnose you. I, I can't tell for sure what's going on. There's one thing that I would suggest that you take a look at if your doctors haven't looked at it yet. Um, and that is with these fevers, chills, even a stomach pain, even the headaches, I, I hope they looked for Babesia in you. Uh, Babesia is a infection that yes, even cattle can have, I believe, and um, ticks can spread it. There may be other vectors that spread it. The best test to see if you might have Babesia would be the immunoblot testing method through Igenix, okay? There may be other um, infections from cattle. I'm just not aware of off the top of my head or livestock. Okay. Uh, but I would, I would, from what you've described here, I'd be concerned to look for the possibility of babesia. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you, JC. Hi, Laura. <laughs> thank you. She says, no question. Just a huge thank you for everything that you do for patients and families. You're, you're welcome. My, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. So Sandy says... What do you recommend to stop muscle wasting? Thanks for your webinars. All right, so we're running out of time here. I'm gonna show you an article that I've written about muscle wasting. Um, and uh, let me just do that here real quick. All right, so there's an art. This is a recent article. I think this is, um, gosh, maybe within the last month or so, I did this one. How to fix muscle wasting and tick borne infections and bowel toxicity. Okay, all right. And so I talk about the different causes and I talk about the different things you can do to help with that as well, too. All right, so I take a look at that article basically. All right, okay. And then while I'm screen sharing here, so, um, Many of you may know if you if you're enjoying these webinars, um, you might also want to take a look at becoming a member of my Lyme disease support group called Lyme United. And um, I I know you're coming back to these webinars, so you're getting benefit here. My um, Lyme United group would be like my conversation. This webinar that I do here on Thursday night would be like that on steroids. All right. Because in addition um, to a weekly webinar that I have in Lime United, the Lime United webinar that I have is actually in a Zoom room so I can ask you questions back and forth. So you know tonight, I couldn't help everyone because I couldn't ask questions. Well, in Lime United, I can, okay? And then um, the other, I'm just gonna show you what Lime United looks like. So this is what Lime United looks like and in Lime United, um, we have different forums. So there's like a user guide that tells you how to use it. Uh, we have obviously customer support section. We ask that each one of our members introduces themselves to us um, so that we can all welcome them and get to know who they are. There is a forum in Lime United where members ask questions and give advice and support to each other. And I gotta tell you, we have a very smart group of people here that are coming up with some really great ideas. I learned from some of our members as well too, all right? There's another forum where you can share your wins on Wednesdays. And I see that I have misspelled when, I think I've misspelled Wednesdays. Ha, huh, it's the first time I'm seeing it there, but anyhow, um, no, I guess it is spelled correctly. Anyhow, um, so uh, uh, share your wins on Wednesdays. And we, that way we learn, if somebody has got something growing good, we can learn from what they did that got them to that good spot, okay? And then there are two ways you can interact directly with me. One is an office hours that I run from um, 12 to one each day. 
I take any questions that people have written to me in the last 24 hours, Monday to Friday, and I spend one hour writing responses back, okay? And in addition, our members are also responding to some of these questions too. So we get a lot of input, all right? And then there is my Ask Marty Ross MD Live, which is a, a weekly hour and a half webinar that's held in a Zoom room where you can ask me a bunch of stuff and I can ask you a bunch of stuff. And our members jump in and give lots of advice as well too. And then finally, uh, we have a space where our members can create their own events. And so we do have some events going on there right now as well too, all right? So I invite you to join Lime United. If you're getting some good work uh, benefit out of my free weekly webinar, you'll get a lot more even out of Lime United. So look through here, um, I explain it in writing. I talk about the different forums. We even have testimonials from people. And if you click on the join now, uh, you can see what the cost is. You can also look down here. There's a table down here, all right? Describe uh, what the benefits are of joining Lime United and what the cost is as well too, all right? And for a limited time, we were doing the first 30 days free, although I may be ending that shortly. So if you're wanting to try it out for free, um, I may be starting to think about limiting that here coming up, all right? All right. Let me go back here. All right, everyone. So I just gave you my Lime United pitch. I hope I hope you'll join us. I, we got a very active, we got about 60 members now and uh, we're growing. Um, it'd be great to get more members. Uh, the more members we have, the more learning we all do from each other and the more support as well too, okay? And then um, I just, so that's it for our order tonight. Um, I, I'm glad to have been here with you. We had a good group tonight and um, I look forward to seeing you next week. Keep an eye out in your morning for an email from me that will have uh, the link to the recording for today as well as a summary. And in addition, you'll be able to sign up for next week's uh, webinar as well too. All right, all right. Good night. Oh, one last thing. When you do that, when you get that email, share it with other people. Let people know what we're doing here. If you're getting benefit, other people are gonna get benefit too. My goal is to help as many people in the world with Lyme disease as I possibly can in the world, all right? So help me meet that goal, all right? Thanks, everyone. Good night.